and now it's time for this week's Just the Tip. And since we're rolling into springtime here, this is going to be a nice little tip if you are going to be making any kind of cocktails or any fun specialty drinks uh, over the course of the spring and summer. I'm going to talk to you real quickly about how to make your own simple syrup. Now, you can buy a simple syrup pretty cheap at basically any grocery store, and they even have them that are flavored. If, if you can't find them in the regular part of the grocery store, you should be able to find them if there's a liquor store or attached to the grocery store or something like that. But to make one at home, it's super simple. It is equal parts water and granulated sugar. That's important, not powdered sugar. It's granulated sugar. So equal parts water and granulated sugar. What you're going to do is carefully bring this to a boil. And then once it gets to a boil, you're going to turn it down to a simmer and just let it simmer for 10, 15 minutes. And that's it. Once you do that, the sugar will be dissolved in the water. It'll be one just kind of thicker liquid and let it cool down. And then you can pour it into a container, whether it's a squeeze bottle or some mason jar or something like that. And it will hold in the refrigerator uh, for about a week. I, I can't remember if it's shelf stable or not, but for sure, just put it in the refrigerator and you're good to go for about a week. Now, to spice things up, if you want to add something like cinnamon sticks in or berries or fresh herbs or anything like that, jalapenos, you can do that. Uh, just experiment a little bit with how you want to do that um, ratio-wise because it can be pretty intense if you're not careful. I urge you that when you boil water and sugar to be very careful, make sure there's no kids around or anything like that because if that gets on your skin, that is not good. So nothing to be afraid of. Just be, be cautious about that. Uh, simple syrup, equal parts water, granulated sugar, bring to a boil, reduce it down to a simmer, let it cook for 10, 15 minutes, let it cool, and Bob's your uncle. That is this week's Just the Tip. All right, and now it's time for this week's Just the Tip. And this week's Just the Tip is another food tip, and I'm talking about measuring out food ingredients. And I always recommend, whenever possible, using a gram scale to measure out food. Now, I'm not talking about your weed gram scale. I'm talking about an actual food gram scale. You can get these at Target, at Walmart, at Williams-Sonoma, Amazon. If you live near a restaurant supply store, you can definitely get them there. And if you've never been to a restaurant supply store, it's pretty cool. If you like food, if you like cooking, uh, that's where all the commercial food service places shop, all the restaurants shop as they go in and buy stuff there. It's open to the public. So they're all they're all over the country, uh, different, different brands, different names. Uh, but I highly recommend if you haven't been in one, go check it out if you like food. There's, it's really cool stuff and you can see what, what the pros use, as they say. But back to, back to just the tip. I would recommend using a gram scale and measuring out all of your food or ingredients by gram uh, whenever possible. And the reason for that is because let's say a recipe calls for one cup flour. All right, great. Well, one cup flour is somebody scoops it and there's a huge heap uh, of the scoop and that's one cup. Another person scoops it and they run their finger across it and that's one cup. Another person scoops it and there's big air pockets in there. So it's, it looks like it's a cup of flour, but it's really not. Now for most home recipes, it's, it's not the end of the world. But if you're trying to dial in a recipe or you're working with something that's a little more finicky, all the sourdough bread recipes out there or anything like that, it's, it really is essential that you measure food and ingredients out in grams, even liquids. And the reason why is you, the variance that I just talked about, that can drastically throw off a recipe. And when I used to cook in kitchens, I remember uh, some of the restaurants I worked at, we would just you know use a scale and measure by ounces or, or whatever, kind of eyeball it. And then I went to work at a, at a really good restaurant where we measured everything by grams. And I was like, boy, you could see the difference in the precision of the recipes and you could see the difference in the consistency day in, day out at the recipes. So you, know, you see everybody online and they're making stuff. It's like, man, making that day in, day out, you really need to be dialed in on, on the ingredients. You really need to be dialed in on the, the technique and all of that. So having a scale that measures in grams that allows you to measure pretty, pretty precise is a great way to start. So that is my tip. Again, you can buy it anywhere, but I highly recommend getting a gram scale. And that is this week's Just the Tip. Okay, this is one of the silliest, most obvious, um, roll your eyes, just the tip segments. But it is something that has been, and I say this um, passionately, a game changer in my life. And it is the simple concept of having a garbage can in your car. And that might seem as obvious 
as as day but having a garbage can in your car is something that can dramatically improve the quality of your life and for years almost a decade i worked in outside sales so you know my office was my car i was in my car all day long driving around the dallas fort worth area and i would pack a lunch so i'd pack my food pack my snacks i'd bring water sometimes i'd stop and get a coffee or get a, a gatorade or something at you know a gas station and man the, the front passenger um floor used to be my garbage can and at the end of every day or every week i mean it was hilarious i'm dr- make a turn and you can just hear this cascade of, of empty um vessels of water bottles and wrappers just rolling around the car so i finally got a garbage can uh it sits behind me in the passenger uh back seat on the ground and it's something i can reach without even having to take my eyes off the road And I can drop in something, especially with kids. It's a huge thing. My wife fought me on this for a long time. She didn't want a garbage can in her car. And then every time I would get in, it was like, you know, just entering a garbage disposal. So finally got that. So obviously the most simple, basic, just the tip segment. But if you do not have a garbage can in your car, go get one on Amazon. Um, I'll have a link um, where you can get this one. And um, the one that I use in the show notes and um, go take a look at it and you will be so pleasantly surprised. Don't just get a target bag, get an actual little garbage can for your car. That is this week's Just the Tip. For this week's Just the Tip, I'm going to stay with the golf theme, if you can believe that. Now, I have been golfing since I've been about seven years old. I'm 43, so do the math on however old that is. I've never been particularly good. I will tell you, when I was 10 years old, I got a hole in one. Clearly, it was nothing but skill and zero luck was involved in any way, shape, or form. Um, I do remember everybody saying that they needed to give me their autograph on the scorecard. And what they were telling me, the group that saw the hole-in-one when I was 10, was, hey, we need to sign your card to verify that you actually got a hole-in-one. But they, all these older guys kept saying, we need to give you our autograph. And as a 10 year old, I remember thinking, wait, I'm the one who hit the hole in one. I should be giving you my autograph, right? So clearly that was the highlight and and peak of my golf uh, career. And it happened three years into playing. It's been downhill ever since, but I love golfing and I try to do it as frequently as I can um, while still making time for the fam. And a very quick tip that helps me if anybody is golfing or looking to golf, or even if you are going to top golf or someplace like that, If you're struggling to hit a particular club or struggling to hit any of your clubs and you're doing some practicing, uh, because you can't do this in in an actual uh, game of golf, but if you're doing some practicing or you're at a top golf, is use a tee and tee it up low, but use a tee and just that little bit of elevation um, from the ball off of the mat or off of the grass can help make uh, you get under the ball a lot easier and help make you uh, just get comfortable with swinging a golf club. I'm sure there's a million people out there who are way, way better and more qualified at golf than me uh, that will argue with that a thousand percent. But that is something that has helped me. That is something that helped me years ago when I had golf lessons is that the, the pro that was helping me said, let's focus on hitting off of a tee for all of your uh, clubs for a while to get you comfortable with your swing pattern and just comfortable with the speed of swinging a golf club and all that kind of stuff. And it makes it just a little bit easier and you kind of get, you kind of can make the mental connection um, of how to do the the actual swing, and then you can start working, um, you know, without the tee. But there you go. That is my quick, just the tip, and it works even if you're at Top Golf. All right, and now it's time for this week's just the tip. And right around the corner, well, right smack dab in the middle, right now, it is summertime, and that is time for cookouts, time for grilling out, time for cooking out, and to kind of go along with managing your stress and managing your workload. My just the tip is revolving around when you are the host at the summer grill out or the summer cookout or you're hosting a birthday party or friends are coming over and you're in charge of the food. My advice to you is pair the menu down. So one thing you can do is pick instead of five things, pick two. So nobody is going to remember that you had 11 different offerings on on the counter or or that you had steak and hamburgers and hot dogs and chicken and ribs and brisket and all that so my advice is hey if you're doing if you're grilling out grill one to two things that's it if you're looking at side dishes 
have one to suit two side dishes and that's it. If you're looking at a signature cocktail or something like that, have one, have it be something that you can make ahead of time, hold in the fridge, and then all you have to do is serve it. And the second part of this, just the tip, is if you do want to expand the menu, which I understand you can't just have just hamburger and you know corn as the only two things and you've got 10 people at your house, get use use the chips and the salsa and use the dips and use pre-made or store-bought stuff or things you can do ahead of time. Let those things be the accessories that kind of fill in the gaps of your menu. So you're planning a, you know, a, a summer cookout, a July 4th cookout, right? Do burgers and hot dogs on the grill. That's easy to manage. Throw one vegetable on the grill like corn. If you're going to have another side, do like a pasta salad or a potato salad. You can make that one, two, three days ahead of time. Keep it in the fridge. It gets better as the days go on. So you're good there. And then fill in the rest of the gaps with chips and store-bought salsa or guac or a seven-layer dip or something that you can buy at the store or, you know, or let dessert be something that you purchase. You pick up some cookies or some cupcakes or something like that. So that's an easy way to manage where you can still enjoy the party that you're hosting instead of just running around because let's face it, you're not a line cook, you're not a chef, and there's no expectation to have that you should be able to manage, you know, 15 different things that are cooking and some inside, some outside. That's not fair. All you're going to do is stress yourself out and nothing is going to come out the way that you want. So pare down the menu, use store-bought things to fill in the gaps, crack a beer, and enjoy your summer cookout. That is this week's Just the Tip. Now it's time for this week's Just the Tip. And this week's Just the Tip is a cooking tip that as we get into the summer season, and any really anything, any time of the year. But it is, my, my tip to you is to be very aware of matching your cutting board and your knife size to the, the food product that you are going to be cutting on that cutting board and with that knife. So for example, if you have a apple or you have a small tomato or you have strawberries, you can use a small cutting board with a small paring knife. That's great. If you have a watermelon or a cantaloupe or a squash or something like that, uh, you need a big cutting board and you need a big long knife. And too often, myself included, I'm like, well, I don't want to wash this or I don't want to try to put it through the dishwasher or, you know, this is too big of a mess. I don't want to deal with it. I just grab like, you know, a a cutting board the size of a, a postage stamp and then a tiny little knife and I try to cut, you know, something way bigger than that. So, that is how injuries can happen, and that is how um, getting very poor cuts and odd-shaped sizes and, and a poor yield out of the food. You're spending all this money on a watermelon at the grocery store. You need to make sure that you get as much much of it as, as you can to be able to use. That's called yield for, for food is you get a high yield on that food. So if you have a big watermelon, get a big cutting board, get a big knife. And for a watermelon, I specifically recommend a serrated uh, bread knife uh, and cut it that way and you will have plenty of space, just like you cannot stuff all the, all the watermelon that you, cook, that you cut into a very small um, Tupperware container. You need a big container, same thing with that. I know it sounds simple, but always go up a size in whatever you think that you're gonna need for a cutting board and a knife, and that will help preserve your fingers, <laughs> and it will help make sure that you get a better yield out of your product and a more even, set of cuts and all of that sort of stuff. So that is this week's Just the Tip. Match the cutting board and the knife appropriately to the food that you're cutting.